Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Distinguished Speakers, dear participants, it's my deep honor and privilege to welcome you to this important conference entitled Child Protection in Armed Conflict, Establishing a Mediterranean Dialogue on the Rights of the Child, which has been co-organized by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs International Cooperation and the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. Children in armed conflict are extremely vulnerable. Last year, the Office of the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict reported over 25,000 violations against children in the 21 situations of conflict covered by the office itself. Deep concern arises at high and increasing number of children recruited by armed groups and forces killed or maimed, including by the indiscriminate or disproportionate attacks in contravention of international law, as well as through torture or summary execution or by being used as suicide bombers. Likewise, international community is very concerned to see a mounting trend in attacks against school and hospitals, rape and other forms of sexual violence, abduction and denial of humanitarian assistance. Several international legal instruments for protecting children in armed conflict have been adopted, but that's not sufficient. Our common challenge is to immediately put an end and prevent such grave violations of international law. For this to happen, a joint commitment of all stakeholders is required, including institutions, civil society organizations, academic community. They must work together for achieving the common aim of giving hopes to all children affected by armed conflict. For this reason today, with representative of the United Nations and the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, we have with us a representative of Save the Children International, the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack, the International Institute of Humanitarian Law, and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. Allow me to express my deep honor to play today my role of moderator of a such important conference in representation of the first international universities network for children in armed conflict. 38 universities from all over the world joined together in order to work in line also with the United Nations agenda as the new constructive resource for the international community through multidisciplinary trainings and through the research needed to end and prevent violations against children in armed conflict, as well as assist their social reintegration. The universities network, which is also working to strengthen partnership with universities from Mediterranean area, is promoted also by the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, thus further demonstrating the deep sensitivity of the Italian government on this issue. Italy has always placed itself in the front line for the protection of minors in situation of armed conflict, as recently confirmed by the Italian pledge made during the 43rd International Conference of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, and by the full support for the implementation of the Safe School Declaration. Then we are very pleased to have with us today Ms. Marina Sereni, Vice Ministry of the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, to whom I'm very honored to give the floor. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to open this high level panel, indeed a unique opportunity of discussion on the importance to protect the rights of children living on in situation of armed conflict, uh, aimed at increasing cooperation across the Mediterranean region on this important issue. I wish to thank our moderator, Professor Laura Guercio, representative of the University's Network for Children in Armed Conflict, a brand new international reality, which gathers, as she told before, 30 eight universities all around the world focused on raising awareness among students on these matters. We are now at the sixth edition of MED Dialogue. This year, everything is different. Rome MED has been historically a hub for meetings and dialogue between the two shores of the Mediterranean and beyond a sort of community that during these years learned to know and to respect each other. This year, we are a virtual community, 
As a result, we had to re rethink some of the paradigms of our conference. The tragedy of pandemic that we are all facing is forcing us to innovate, to prioritize, rethink, give a new meaning even to the positive agenda, which is the true flagship of MED Dialogue. The impact of COVID is affecting not only our health, it is deeply touching our societies on both shores of the Mediterranean and beyond. It is making us more fragile and vulnerable. This is why I cannot think of a more appropriate way of opening med dialogues than with this panel. Our main concern is this in this extraordinary time must be the protection of those who are more fragile and who are living in conditions of extreme, extreme vulnerability. And who is more vulnerable and fragile than children living in armed conflicts? The Italian approach to the protection of the rights of children living in armed conflicts aims at being multifaceted. We are engaged both at bilateral and multilateral level through humanitarian and development cooperation initiatives, side by side with non-governmental organizations, international organizations and academic institutions. Protecting children is a key priority for Italy. In our view, working together to put an end to the worst forms of violations on, of the rights of children during armed conflicts is a moral imperative. These violations undermine the physical and psychological development of children and, as a direct consequence, they threaten the stability and the welfare of the whole society. This year, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the first optional protocol to the Convention on the Right of the Child on the Involvement of Child in Armed Conflict. We are committed to promoting the universal ratification of the protocol and we urge all countries to ratify it as soon as possible. However, signing and ratifying international instruments is not enough. Tangible actions must follow. We must ensure that children are preserved from being used as soldiers, slaves, military shields or targets and we have to make sure that they are also provided with opportunities to enjoy a better future. Let me also underline an aspect to which I personally and my country as well attach the utmost importance. We have to maintain a special focus on girl children. Violations against girl children take specific forms, violence, slavery and human trafficking, sexual abuses and violence, enforced pregnancies, forced prostitution, female genital uh, mutilation, child and early forced marriages and forced childbearing. Italy considers fundamental to adopt a specific approach for the protection of girl children. And I am glad to have the occasion of pointing out this fact today on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. We look forward to the organization of a high-level event on violence against girl children in conflict, which could not pl take place last March because of the pandemic. At the 30, 33rd International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent in Geneva in December 2019, Italy presented an open pledge. We committed to undertake all actions necessary to reduce the impact of wars on the life of children. Our pledge continues to be the most supported among all pledges presented at the Geneva Conference. And we call on, we call on all our international partners to join us in this initiative. Today, we have the chance to concentrate our discussion on the Mediterranean region and partners. I hope we represent the first step of a more structured political dialogue on this issue. 
as a tangible follow-up, let me mention the fourth Safe Schools International Conference that will take place in Nigeria next spring. I hope we will prefer this, prepare this fundamental gathering with concrete joint initiatives. I am very happy to see here today the co-chair of the Global Coalition that we thank for the restless work to protect education in situation of armed conflicts. The Safe School Conference could be an important occasion to demonstrate that the Mediterranean region has a strong, a resolute will to work together and to achieve tangible results. Italy considers of fundamental importance to continue pro providing education to children, also in times of war. Protecting students, educational personnel, and school infra infrastructure from attacks and from improper and dangerous use. It would be an outstanding signal to the rest of the world, an inspiring example, if all the states of the Mediterranean region could join the Safe Schools Declaration. COVID-19 is exposing children in armed conflicts to additional forms of violence, exploitation, and abuse further exacerbating their vulnerability. In this difficult moment, we must strengthen and coordinate our efforts to ensure that children's health is always protected, also by preventing armed attacks on hospitals and guaranteeing that humanitarian assistance has no impediment. To this end, I would be, it would be important to enlarge the Mediterranean participation to the group of Friends for Children and Armed Conflict, both in Geneva and in New York, in order to strengthen our collaboration in this relevant fora by undertaking joint initiatives aimed at preventing and combating the six violations against children identified by the United Nations Council. The Mediterranean region, side by side with the United Nations and all relev relevant stakeholders, could really move towards a systematic and coherent approach for the protection of children in armed conflict, helping them to achieve a better future. As I said at the beginning, a renewed positive agenda must be built also on this issue. COVID-19 has hit dramatically on both sides of the Mediterranean, severely damaging our economies and forcing us to physical distance. However, it, is also, it also forced us to realize that since we are all sharing the same tragedy, we indeed have a common destiny. I am glad to notice that this essential element has been realized by the EU which has taken a decisive role in fighting the pandemic and its health and socio-economic impact both at home within the union and externally with a special attention to the enlarged Mediterranean and sub-Saharan Africa. We have to move forward together and we can't start, be, we can start by being even more assertive and effective in addressing key issues such as the protection of children in armed conflict. I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sereni, for recalling us the importance of taking tangible and concrete actions, such as those you have proposed, in order to put an end to the grave violations against children. As you said, the signing and ratifying an international instrument is not enough. We must effectively act. On this point, the today panel can be a first step for promoting, as you said, Ms. Sereni, a more structured Mediterranean dialogue aimed at enforcing the protection of children in armed conflict. Before I recall the work carried out by the office of Ms. Virginia Gamba, special representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict. And we are very honored today to listen directly from the, her voice, the challenges the international community has to face for granting child's rights in armed conflict. Ms. Gamba sent us a video that we are pleased to listen now. Excellencies, dear colleagues, I want to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy for its continued support to my office and for inviting me to take part in this important event. 
Conflict remains the greatest challenge to the realization of the promise contained in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Due to this, the standards in the Convention have been periodically upgraded, including through the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, as well as at regional level, for example, in the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. The standards have been further strengthened through 12 resolutions of the United Nations Security Council, as well as through political commitments, such as those in the Paris Principles and Guidelines, the Safe Schools Declaration and the Vancouver Principles. My office, which was created over 24 years ago, monitors and reports to the Security Council on the status of the six grave violations against children and we further engage with parties to conflict to develop over 52 joint action plans to end and prevent violations. We also raise awareness by rolling out the Act to Protect campaign and by developing special initiatives to identify and, as possible, close any gaps that impede action to better protect children and prevent violations against them. Gaps identified led us to develop a global coalition for reintegration that seeks to improve reintegration services for children separated from conflict. The development, launch and rolling out of a technical guideline note for mediators so that they can bring children and armed conflict language to the heart of peace agreements and projects for developing and expanding child protection capacity. As you know from our latest annual report to the Security Council, 25,000 violations were committed during 2019, with the greatest increases occurring around attacks on schools and hospitals, denial of humanitarian access, and continued sexual violence against children. Today, the current COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating uh, these existing patterns of grave violations. Confinement measures increase the risks of gender-based violence, including rape and other forms of sexual violence against boys and girls in armed conflict. Children are further put at risk by ongoing attacks on hospitals and restricted access to healthcare and social services. We are also seeing more hospitals targeted by extremely violent armed groups, precisely because the vulnerable communities are now in need of these facilities. Attacks on health workers, particularly polio and Ebola vaccinators in Asia and in Africa, are on the increase, while terror attacks on hospitals, such as those in Libya and in Afghanistan, in the last few months are an early warning of attacks to come when the COVID-19 vaccine is available and starts to be distributed to affected populations. Further, the socio-economic impact of lockdowns has generated poverty, which in turn creates a push factor for early marriage of girls and the recruitment of minors by armed forces and groups. We already are witnessing an increase in recruitment of children for conflict-related purposes. Schools have been targeted in the last few years as a tactic of war by armed groups, primarily against the education of girls, but now schools' closures have made the empty school infrastructure a very tempting target for military occupation. Lockdowns have also made referral to services of children, including reintegration services very difficult, if not impossible, with heavy delays in delivery of service. Now if we turn to the Mediterranean Basin, of the 21 situations of conflict we cover, four are in this region. Here my main concerns are denial of humanitarian access, use and abuse of vulnerable or unaccompanied children displaced from war zones, attacks on schools and hospitals, and the possible increase in the recruitment and use of children by armed groups and forces as the COVID-19 pandemic becomes a push factor for conflict. My first concern is the limited access to conflict zones. If the United Nations and humanitarian agencies cannot enter conflict-affected areas, we are neither able to monitor and report on grave violations, nor can we protect or arrange for the release, assistance or reintegration of these children. This is particularly relevant to Libya, where the UN presence is very limited. My second concern is the situation of displaced children. Migrant children escaping war-torn countries and often traveling unaccompanied are extremely vulnerable and at risk of being victims of grave violations. 
Libya is a major transit country to Europe and thus hosts a remarkably large migrant population that is even more endangered in an already unsafe environment. Unaccompanied children may suffer from abduction, recruitment, sexual exploitation and trafficking, and the privation of liberty. I am also concerned about Lebanon as the country that contains vast numbers of displaced children. In Lebanon, Syrian and Palestinian refugee children are prone to experience violence, including recruitment and use and killing and maiming while residing in camps where they are particularly vulnerable. Finally, I am concerned at attacks on schools and hospitals. In the Mediterranean region, attacks on schools have been the highest in Syria, while attacks against hospitals are on the increase in Libya. We have witnessed mounting attacks against medical facilities and personnel in the last six months, and this will increase as the COVID-19 vaccines become available. In order to address these challenges, Mediterranean basin countries might wish to start a dialogue on prevention measures in key cooperation areas such as in ensuring the child relevant language is applied to ongoing peace talks between warring parties and that access for humanitarian assistance be granted b ensuring that reintegration centers are functioning and that they have resources to provide extended support to separated children C. Prioritizing training of more child protection experts to be deployed in the field. And lastly, rolling out public awareness campaigns, including through regional approaches to prevention. Firstly, ongoing peace talks, for example, affecting Libya and the Israel and occupied Palestinian territories today, would particularly benefit from including children issues at the heart of that discussion. To assist in this task, my office published a practical guidance for mediators to better protect children in situations of armed conflict, released shortly before the Secretary General called for a global ceasefire due to the pandemic. I would welcome you to promote and use these guidelines in your peace endeavors, in Libya or elsewhere. While you do so, you may also advocate for increased access to United Nations agencies and other partners to areas of conflict so that, between us, the provision of relief, the monitoring of the well-being, the advocacy for separation of children from armed groups and the handover of children to reintegration centers can be continued and reinforced. Second, you might consider joining the Global Coalition on Reintegration that engages in researching, developing, and piloting comprehensive long-term and sustainable reintegration programs where children can recover from trauma, receive education and health services, including mental health, and learn life-saving skills that can assist in their reinsertion to their own communities. We need resources for reintegration, but we also need the best programming possible so that reintegration centers can become a pull factor stronger than the push factor of socioeconomic insecurity that pushes children to join or rejoin armed groups today. Third, child protection expertise on the ground must be retained, expanded upon and supported. We see some positive developments with the inclusion of stronger child protection language in UNSMIL and other peace support operations, but this language must be matched with the adequate implementation resources. Similarly, my office is working with countries such as Malta to develop capacity building and training modules on child protection. Making universities aware that child protection is a specialization and should be treated as such across many academic disciplines ranging from law to medicine to social work to international relations and humanitarian work is a priority today. Fourth, raising awareness on the nature of violations against children in armed conflict and the best methods to prevent and end this violence is an imperative. We need to advocate for the signature and ratification of all best practice standards, such as the Optional Protocol, the Paris Principles, the Sex Schools Declaration, and the Vancouver Principles. We also need to roll out the Act to Protect campaign in the Mediterranean Basin in all languages of the region. 
Lastly, I would like to suggest that a series of round tables be held for the discussion of common prevention approaches among all regional organizations that share a stake in the Mediterranean Basin. The League of Arab States, the African Union, the European Union and even NATO have a role in the protection and prevention of violations against children in this region. They should complement each other to reinforce prevention. I have opened a liaison office of CAC for Europe in Brussels that stands ready to assist such region-to-region -region roundtables should you decide to undertake them. Meanwhile, I beg you to continue to place the CAC agenda high in your list of priorities. The children deserve no less than our full commitment to stop and end their suffering and abuse. Thank you very much for your attention. As Ms. Gamba and Ms. Sereni underline, child protection in armed conflict is a multidimensional agenda, and altogether we must invest in creating the resources needed to work on this issue and share ideas and suggestions on these very sensitive issues. This is the aim of the panel of this conference, which sees the presence of representatives of organizations very committed to the defense of human rights and especially to the rights of children. I would like to immediately give them the floor for reflecting together on a first point. Which joint action should be taken in the Mediterranean area to move towards a systematic and coherent approach for the protection of children in armed conflict? Specifically, I would uh, uh, like to ask Ms. Inger Ashing, Chief Executive Officer of Save the Children International, what are the main trends regarding child rights violations in armed conflict that we are seeing through the Mediterranean area? Please, Ms. Ashing, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I first want to start by thanking Deputy Minister Marina Serini uh, for Italy's commitment to protecting children in conflict. And I also want to thank you for, for giving us the opportunity to contribute to this very important discussion. And as we've heard from both the keynote speakers, too many children are experiencing the worst student mentality in conflict settings around the world and in the wider Mediterranean. Uh, as an organization, Say the Children works to ensure children can learn, survive, and be protected from conflict. And from our work in the region, we see the devastating impact of war on children. Uh, we watched a report last week uh, where we found that almost 40% of the children in the Middle East live in a conflict zone. And that is the highest proportion of any region in the world. This is a staggering figure, and unfortunately, it is on the base. Um, as a result, children are exposed to unimaginable violence, which can have catastrophic consequences for the rest of their lives. Across the world, over the past decade, more than 90,000 children were killed and maimed in conflict. On an average, that is 25 children every day. 25 children every day. And it's not hyperbolic to say that unless we take urgent action and collective action, we risk losing an entire generation in parts of the Middle East and the Mediterranean. I can give you a few examples. In Yemen, uh, an escalation of the conflict in October led to the highest number of tortured case uh, among children over the past year. A team on the ground, Dr. Hamid, 16 years old, who was badly wounded by shrapnel. He told us that the most difficult thing now is not being able to see other children walking on top of me. Hamid represents just only one story of many that we hear every day around the, the, the conflict in the Mediterranean area. Uh, and indeed, explosive weapons were responsible for about a third of children killed and maimed during the post trading conflict. And the percentage is much higher in Syria, that there is 67%, and in Iraq, 70%. Bombs, rockets, and artillery are designed for use in the battlefield. But however, as modern conflict is increasingly fought in urban areas, we see that it's widely, more widely used on populated areas. And, um, and this, of course, has implications for children, and it has implications for, for civilian overall. And uh, a shopping, shocking 90% of the deaths and injuries weapons when used in populated areas are civilian, and the majority of them being children. Being smaller and developing their bodies, they are the injuries that children get are often more severe and complex to treat uh, than those suffered by adults. 
and not to mention the long-term social uh, psychological impact on children. Uh, and, and as we've heard from, from the previous uh, speakers, uh, explosive weapons uh, in populated areas also lead to the destruction of essential infrastructure. It, this can in, in, uh, then lead to uh, preventing children from accessing education, cross displacement, or economic crisis, and exacerbate underlying vulnerabilities. Earlier this month, uh, beginning of November, a primary school run by a partner to save the children was hit during intense shelling in the Syrian province of Idlib. Four children, including a four-year-old child, a girl, uh, was killed on their way to school, and dozens of other people were wounded. And this happens as we speak around the world. Uh, and the global pandemic is making matters even worse for children affected by conflict in the wider Mediterranean. Instead of adhering to policies declared, called by a uh, by the UN Secretary General, ongoing violence across the region is during the fight against COVID-19, increasing the needs of children and their families. While children are less affected by the direct implications of the virus, the health implications, the secondary uh, impacts uh, will affect children more than other groups in, in society, including the economic shocks, school closures, and shrinking aid budgets. They have, will have profound implications for the most vulnerable children. Uh, earlier this year, we did a global survey where we talked to over 25,000 children and their caregivers and asked them how they uh, have experienced the pandemic and how it has impacted them. And it is clear from the findings that, that uh, the most deprived and marginalized children are being exacerbating existing inequalities and pushing the most vulnerable children even further behind. Too many children are missing out of school, um, and for many of them, there is a real risk that they will never return. For girls, which we also heard as one of the priority groups, and it is for several children as well. It means the increased exposure to gender-based violence and risk of child marriages, which will have impact for the rest of their lives and, and robbing them of a childhood. Uh, for, for other children, especially boys, there, there is an increased uh, risk of recruitment. A final point of concern I wanted to raise in, in relation to, to this question is uh, the increased treatment of children as a national security threat. And uh, with international norms clearly stipulating that children should be detained only as a matter of last resort, we, we see thousands of children that are currently detained across the Middle East today. And, and we see that children that living under the control of ex ex extremist uh, armed groups suffer immensely, immensely. And when they are finally released, instead of being uh, treated as victims, they focus on their rehabilitation and recovery, they are too often treated as a threat and deprived of their liberty. 65,000 people, just to give you an example, are estimated to live in under conditions in the world. Sorry, uh, if. Uh... I, I must recall also the timing, sorry. Uh, I know it's not polite, but uh, we have to give the floor to all the speakers. Yes, I, ha I, would ha I have one more sentence, so if I can just say, say that. So I, I was just saying that we have 65,000 people living in a whole country north of Syria, 65% of them being children. And in, instead of working to repatriate those children together with their family, too many uh, countries are finding excuses not to do so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Ashing. Um, thank you for your clear reply that recall also us that one of the most affected children's rights is the right to education. And on this topic, I would like to ask Ms. Veronique Hubert, co-chair of the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack, which instrument can be employed to improve the protection of education in the conflict-affected countries? Please, Ms. Hubert, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. Um, Excellencies, Honorable Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, ladies and gentlemen, first, I am really honored to participate here today among distinguished panelists. The discussion today provides us with a unique space to prioritize and pursue regional solutions in better protecting children from the devastating impact of conflict. So, yes, Laura, over the last decade, the number of children wounded and killed in conflict rose 300%. Today, conflict continues to have a large impact on communities, fragmenting families, and breaking down support systems, 
such as educational services. Education is extremely vulnerable in situation of armed conflict. And one particularly damaging effect is the proliferation of attack on education. In nearly every conflict around the world, students, teachers, school and universities become the targets of attack. Parents fear sending their children to school in case the school becomes a target. Other risks associated with conflict, such as child recruitment or sexual violence, and have long-term consequences for children and their future, and ultimately disturb any chance of getting an education. In nearly every conflict affected country, girls are particularly vulnerable due to the higher incidence of sexual and gender-based violence. The impact of attacks on education is even more damaging in situations when learning is not restored and many children resort to or are forcibly recruited into armed groups. We've lost generations of children who have been unable to receive an education because their school have been attacked or used as bases by armed forces. The wounds inflicted by armed conflict on children touch upon all aspects of the development, not only physical, but also mental, emotional, and social. Conversely, in time of emergencies, education can be a life-saving, a life-sustaining, and a protective intervention that ensures children are protected from risk and harmful activities that surround them. In the past five years, the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attacks, GCPA, compiled approximately 11,000 reported attacks on education and military use of school and university. These attacks harmed at least 22,000 students and education personnel. Attacks on education include bombing and burning of school and universities, killing and maiming, raping, abducting, arbitrarily arresting and recruiting students and educators at or en route to and from education institutions by armed forces, but also other actors or armed groups during armed conflict and insecurity. GCPA also found that the number of countries experiencing attacks on education has increased in recent years. Between 2015 and 2019, 93 countries experienced at least one attack on education, and up to 74 countries in the previous reporting period of 2013 to 2017. GCPA indeed identified a slight decline in attack on education and military use between 2015 and 2019. Although this decrease represent a positive advance, much work remains to be done to keep learners and educators safe in conflict affected and insecurity. GCPA found that in the Middle East and North Africa region remain particularly affected by attack on education in the past five years. In the Middle East, thousands of girls' school were attacked in 2018 and 2019, which led to the specific and lasting impact on female students and educators, and we are concerned about girls' ability to resume their education following each of these attacks. For example, number of attacks on education remain alarmingly high in Yemen, which experienced over 1,500 documented attacks on school. In Syria, an experience of 800 attacks on school. In Iraq, exploding remnant of war at or near school contributed to put students and teachers at risk, even after a steep decline in fighting during the period covered by the report. In Egypt, attack on school and school students and university students and teachers continued, but at a less frequent rate between 2018 and 2019, than during the previous period. And in Turkey, hundreds of university professors were arrested and sentenced. But the picture is not totally grim, as to address this problem, 106 countries have already joined the Safe School Declaration that commits to protect education from attack. The declaration is grounded in international humanitarian and human rights law, and was adopted at a meeting hosted by the Norwegian Foreign Affairs Ministry in Oslo. The declaration is the result of a process led by the government of Norway and Argentina since 2014, and that received support from other states such as Italy, Spain, Nigeria, and others. By joining the declaration, countries agree to endorse and use the guidelines for protecting school and universities from military use during armed conflict, which call 
for armed parties to avoid using educational buildings and making them targets of attack. The declaration also requires countries to record casualties from attacks on education, assist victims, and support humanitarian programming that promotes the continuation of education during armed conflict. The guidelines are indeed needed to apply by non-state armed groups as well as government armed forces. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Obert. Thank you, Ms. Obert, for your very informative speech. Concrete action to protect education from attack is particularly urgent now with COVID-19 further endangered students' schooling, especially in armed conflict zones. Then I would like to ask Mr. Francesco Rocca, President of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, what are the main challenges for protecting children from violence in conflict zones that are aggravated by COVID-19? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this panel is about can we strengthen the cooperation in the Mediterranean region. So just to, before I answer to your question, let me set uh, the scenario uh, with the three brief uh, uh, points. Uh, firstly, we should be working uh, together to protect and assist child migrants who arrive in the Mediterranean from conflict areas and uh, from around the world. In many countries, we are running specific programs for unaccompanied minors. We are working to address their psychosocial needs. And yet, we know that our services and investments do not match the needs, especially for child migrants who live in uh, conflict only to arrive here and be exposed to a trafficking and risking uh, to be put into prostitution or made to work in exploitative uh, and dangerous settings. It's only by enhancing partnership and having more deliberate approaches that we can fill the gaps. And also, Laura, also being more coherent. This is a, a, what we are trying to do as international federation to our network of national society to advocate to the government to be really coherent when we call, when we talk about this. Because when we cannot see any more uh, situation in the Mediterranean, Virginia mentioned some, Inger mentioned the other a very delicate situation. But I'm thinking uh, for the overcrowded camp uh, in uh, in Greece, so very close to our uh, to our countries in Europe. And we, we see many children, too many children fleeing from war, living in desperate condition without doing appropriate answers to those children. So now we are talking, in a few seconds, we will move to the conflict area. But I think that we must be and approach the issue with the same candor that the children look at us, expecting concrete action after our words and our commitment. So secondly, we should prioritize access to education. Children fleeing conflicts can easily be left out as they face multiple barriers to attend these calls, such as language, legal status, lack of access to information and services. Uh, and, uh, and these are barriers we should be able to overcome together. And Red Cross, uh, Red Cross and National Society in the Mediterranean are working together with authorities to facilitate access to school and after school programming for child migrants. And thirdly, through adolescent and youth network, we can all involve children affected by conflict into local communities and events, and we can support them to unleash their talents. So these were three points that for me, before moving to the conflict area, also for those who are fleeing war and conflicts, is extremely important. I know that the time is expiring, so I, I try to go to the points, uh, and as to the question that you posed me, what are the main challenges, uh, uh, my thoughts are the following. The challenges caused by COVID-19 reinforce and intensify the difficult nature of protecting children in other countries. For example, the ability for children to access protection services is much harder uh, with services providers being closed to the lockdown or be reducing opening hours. Few, very few children in conflict zones have access to online technologies uh, that al would allow them to access support in other ways. And humanitarians can be restricting from reaching certain zones due to the risk of disease spread. And food deficits and poor nutrition are a growing risk for children in hard to access location. And Red Cross Red Crescent societies work with local authorities to try to overcome these challenges. Furthermore, while the COVID-19 pandemic continues, we are continuously learning about its impact, not only the long-term medical condition following the infection, but also its impact on health more broadly. Essential health services are disrupted due to the COVID-19. For example, at least 80 million children under the age of one year are estimated to be at risk of diphtheria, measles, and polio during COVID-19 disruption to the routine vaccinations. 
and mental health. Mental health is another critical issue. Rapid assessment done by the WHO noted significant disruption to both emergency, school-based, and other mental health psychosocial support due to COVID-19. Over 60% of countries reported disruptions to mental health services for vulnerable people, including children, adolescents, older adults, and women uh, uh, requiring antenatal or postnatal services. These figures of uh, mutization and mental health activities are not only related to conflict areas, but they are an important saving for the international community. And if we want to protect vulnerable people, in particular children, we need sustainable and long lasting investments, not only related to COVID 19. Therefore, we are continuing calling you upon donors and partners to continue funding activities such as immunization or psychosocial uh, programs. And I also want to highlight that we must guarantee equal access to the vaccine to everyone, starting for the most vulnerable categories. And I close uh, just uh, with something that uh, Inger mentioned, but is very close to our heart, uh, Save the Children and the Red Cross uh, are the only organization at this moment are working hard in the Allor camp. This is something unbelievable. So when we talk about civil society, and we had and we left thousands of children with, uh, for example, European citizenship. How we can talk about protecting children in war if we are not able to protect our own citizens in the Mediterranean Syria and that they are stranded in that uh, unlivable and unacceptable situation? So uh, we have we have to clean uh, our conscience sometimes in many too many occasions talking about uh, the big picture. But we must start with concrete action, and we show together with uh, with um, with the colleagues. Uh, of, uh, of Save the Children uh, together with our national societies working there, that is possible because few children we were able to uh, repatriate in their own country. So thank you, Laura, for your time. And uh, uh, so I hope that I answered to your question, but this is something that is extremely important. Concrete action start from uh, little steps that we can do to, to dignify the life of the children. Thank you, Mr. Rocca. Thank you, Francesco. Yes, concrete action. And uh, now, just talking about concrete action, I'm wondering which international instrument can be employed to improve child protection in the conflict affected countries. I would like to address this question to Professor Fausto Pocar, Honorary President of the International Institute of Humanitarian Law. Please, Professor Pocar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. Uh, well, the question you put me is a very complex one, actually. Um, it has been said here that it's not enough to uh, ratify instruments, uh, to create new instruments, but the problem is implementing them. Uh, now, uh, but of course, having instruments, uh, living instruments is a, a prerequisite, is a starting point. Without instruments, it's very difficult to work in international cooperation. Uh, but why is it complex? Let me uh, say a couple of things very shortly, because we don't have the time to, uh, to go into details of these legal arguments. First, that uh, in armed conflicts, uh, human rights law continues to be applicable. Uh, so it's not that in armed conflict, human rights do not have to be protected in general. This has been clear now in international law, has been clarified and confirmed by the international um, the International Court of Justice in the famous opinion on the Palestinian wall. So this is one point. The second point I want to make in this regard is that, that uh, um, um, the specific instrument, uh, which is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Operational Protocol on Armed Conflicts, uh, make uh, uh, clear that uh, not only, as is frequently said, uh, uh, children cannot be uh, recruited for participating in armed conflicts, but the uh, rules in the convention are more, are, have a wider impact. Uh, that is, uh, um, in particular, uh, states have uh, under the convention to respect and to ensure respect for the rules of international humanitarian law applicable in armed conflict. So there is a clear renvoi to international humanitarian law. This uh, reference uh, leads us uh, to the essentially to the 
protocols, additional protocols to the Geneva Convention of 1949. The Geneva Convention does not contain much on children, but uh, the protocols do. Uh, in particular, protocol two on non-international armed conflicts, which are most conflicts today. Um, the, in protocol one on international conflicts, uh, uh, the provisions are quite vague, but in, uh, in the second protocol, in the protocol uh, on non-international armed conflicts, there is specific provision in which uh, the, uh, besides the use of children as uh, participants in the conflict, um, there are specific provisions saying, additionally, that stressing the right to education, it has to be ensured, reunion of families, and the removal from areas of hostilities in order that children are protected. This is also linked, of course, uh, sometimes to education, uh, uh, clearly. But I don't want to insist on education now because Mrs. Sober has uh, um, dealt with that uh, exhaustively. Uh, what is the problem now? Is that this uh, international humanitarian law to which the convention refers has no monitoring mechanism in international law. The, uh, Red, the International Committee of the Red Cross tried to have a monitoring system and it didn't work, was not accepted by states. But what we can do is to have this monitoring done by the human rights bodies, because the human rights bodies exist and they can also monitor international humanitarian law indirectly, because through the monitoring of the convention on the rights of the child that refers to humanitarian law, monitoring of humanitarian law can also be, uh, be done. And this could be not only the Committee on the Rights of the Child, but also the Human Rights Committee, which, uh, um, in which the, the Covenant contains uh, Article 24 that deals with the protection of children in general, so can include also a reference of this, uh, of this kind. Having said that, I think that the one thing we can do, uh, in, in the legal framework at least, is using existing instrument instead of trying to uh, set up new, one, uh, new ones, but uh, uh, using them in order to have a better monitoring on what happens in the implementation of this. And of course, the human rights bodies can also give guidelines in order to implement better these conventions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pocar, also for your clear and precise answer to uh, not the question I, uh, I asked you. Uh, but let me ask you all another question on which uh, to reflect together. How can we strengthen cooperation within the Mediterranean region on the issue of child protection during armed conflict particularly on the prevention of the sixth grave violations against children identified by the United Nations. On this second point, uh, Inger, what are the key actions that international community can take to better the situation on the ground? Please, Inger, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and, and I will be brief. Uh, uh, I, I would like to propose uh, concrete action at three levels. Yes. Uh, the first one is around upholding standards of conduct in conflict. And, and several uh, of the other speakers have been referring to the Safe School Declaration as a great example of an uh, initiative building on, on uh, existing international framework to address specific needs of children in conflict to better protect them. And, and despite the, the progress of all, and where we have 106 uh, endorsements, there's still uh, a lot of, of uh, work needed in the wider Mediterranean. So I think that that's Upholding standards of conflict of conduct in conflict is critical, and, and I urge all more countries to stand behind the, the process led by Ireland to, towards the political declaration of avoiding the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. The second is about accountability for, for violations, and, and too many parties violate their international obligations without consequences, and until we ensure an end to impunity, children will not be protected. And there is a need for cooperation across the wider Mediterranean to, to achieve this. Uh, we need to look at accountability mechanisms, etc. And the final uh, 
thing that I would like to say is, is that we need other practical steps to protect children, and that includes donors uh, funding uh, child protection uh, in response plans that is chronically underfunded today. Uh, where we don't, when we have humanitarian uh, responses, we don't uh, build in child protection and we are not including protection for, uh, to work against gender-based violence. So I think those are three other things that I would like uh, to see more of. Thank you, Inga, for your concrete suggestion. And as far as the focus of education, Veronique, how could we endorse the widest adhesion and the implementation of the Safe School Declaration? Please, Veronique, the floor is yours. Thank you, Excellency. Really, we would like indeed to encourage more countries in the MENA region to join the majority of the UN member states by endorsing the Safe School Declaration, namely in Algeria, Bahrain, Egypt, Kuwait, Libya, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, and the United Arab Emirates. But the endorsement of the declaration is just one step, and concerted action to protect education from attack is particularly urgent now as COVID-19 further endangers students' schooling, as presented by SRSG Virginia Gamba. So preventing and responding to attack on education will require national legal redress mechanism and community-led and nationally endorsed regulation, as well as clear prohibition against the use of military use of school purpose. Government must strengthen and support gender responsive implementation of the Safe School Declaration and imp implement the guidelines for protecting school and university from military use during armed conflict. And by all parties to conflict, monitoring and reporting and securing key commitment from armed actors who are the perpetrators of attack on education is crucial. Ensuring safe education must also be included in peace talks. And despite of the impact of conflict on education, very low level of humanitarian funding are indeed provided for education. This is a huge problem as funding measures to prevent, mitigate and respond to attack on education within humanitarian response and development plans and programs is crucial. Donor government should support therefore multi-year flexible funding to help communities rebuild education system over the long term. The declaration since it was open for endorsement there has been a lot of tangible improvement. And I'm gonna give just a few examples, but we have a whole list of reference that can be used to see how it has been um, implemented in countries of peace, but also in those facing conflict. For example, Yemen endorsed the Safe School Declaration in October, 2017. And in 2019, the group of experts on Yemen informed the UN Human Rights Council that sources reported that Yemeni armed forces have commenced to withdraw from some schools as per the commitment taken under the Safe School Declaration. And the Ministry of Education has also established a Safe School Committee following up on endorsing the Safe School Declaration. The Code of Conduct for the Palestinian National Security Forces in Lebanon since 2019 now include special protection for school and universities. And then we have a whole list of countries who have revised their military doctrine to restrict the use of school and universities for military purpose. And these include Switzerland, Denmark, New Zealand. The National Armed Forces of Mali have also committed to operationalize the guidelines by integrating them into a military doctrine and manual. And in recent months, we have seen new efforts to protect schools from military use. And for example, in July, the Syrian Democratic Forces issued an order to all commanders to refrain from using school for military purpose. Thank you, Veronique. Thank you, Veronique, for your important comments. But uh, um, now I'm um, sorry if I interrupted you. Probably uh, we can uh, have other chance to, to talk uh, about these important issues in other meetings. That? Yes, let's mm -hmm. hope so. To very much thank Italy for the incredible support and pledges that Italy has repeatedly uh, made and encouraged others to endorse and implement the Safe School Declaration. And very much hope that many of the states here will be joining the fourth International Safe School Conference in 2021 in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Veronique, for your important comments. Um, unfortunately, time flies. And uh, for this reason, 
I would like uh, um, uh, ask uh, Mr. Rocca, uh, Francesco, a specific question. Um, considering the situation we are now living with COVID-19, uh, I'm wondering how could we reduce the impact of COVID-19 on children living in the situation of armed conflict? May I ask you this question, Francesco? Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's our historical role in the, the conflict area to, to work to our colleagues of the ICRC, to the national societies working there on the ground. The ICRC always supporting and backing the national societies in the conflict, uh, in the conflict area. Um, honestly, I, I would say without being rhetorical and without avoiding to repeat what my, my colleagues in a very wise manner just uh, said about it, uh, my, our concern in this moment is that it is increasing our lack of access in many places. So uh, the, I wonder how we can protect children if we have no access uh, in many places. Uh, how we can protect children if we let them, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, living uh, in overcrowded camp, I mean about a refugee camp. Uh, so, of course, we are increasing our action, for example, from those who fled uh, uh, and they're the living now in um, Cop Bazaar. So, trying uh, to provide them with the uh, PPI or, uh, or uh, teaching them how to, to keep uh, the physical dance. But, but then the question is how they can keep uh, physical distancing uh, living in overcrowded, uh, in overcrowded camps. Uh, this is happening, is happening in many countries of which are now affected uh, by, by, by in the conflict areas and then uh, this is uh, so I would say so increasing the psychosocial support uh, increasing mental health care uh, but then uh, if we lack of access uh, these are empty walls so our call is to have access I'm uh, watching uh, in uh, with concern uh, the, the images that are arriving from Sudan from those in these very days uh, thousands of children are, are fleeing uh, uh, Ethiopia because they ongoing conflict now in Tigray, and uh, we have seen them without no protection. And, and uh, so, of course, we are scaling up our, our response to protect these children. But these are very, very concerning images that are repeating and repeating and repeating, uh, and the dissemination of the international law with the uh, armed group. Uh, ICSC made a recent survey, which is very concerning, about uh, more than uh, in 30 conflict, more than 630 different armed groups uh, that you have to engage in a dialogue to have access uh, in the in the humanitarian uh, uh, for the humanitarians in the conflict area. This is a, is a huge reason of concern. So without many many talks and many words, I'm going to end and saying it's extremely important access, uh, particularly during COVID-19, because they, unfortunately the virus have access, not only the, not only the, the weapons. Yeah. And so this is important for the humanitarians uh, to, to have the ability to, to protect those uh, most in need. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Francesco, for your concrete uh, suggestion. We have talked about many issues and we share many suggestions today. Surely international legal instrument represent one of the basis for an international commitment. Ms. Sereni, in her keynote speech, recalled the optional protocol to the CRC on the involvement of children in armed conflict. On this point, Professor Pocar, Fausto, how can we reach the widest implementation of this important instrument of which this year we celebrated its 20th anniversary? Please, the floor is yours. Professor Pocar? Yes. That's a very important question you are raising. Uh, the optional protocol is uh, uh, neglected by many participants that uh, ratify the protocol, but nevertheless do not implement it. But we have to bear in mind that protocol is only dealing with partic direct participation of children in armed conflict. So recruitment, enlistment, and use of children in armed conflict only. Does not take all the other aspects of the protection of children during armed conflict. Uh, let me, uh, therefore, perhaps uh, speak also of another optional protocol, which is, to my view, extremely important in, uh, in our uh, field. And that's the protocol on uh, individual and the state communications to the Convention of the Rights of the Child. That protocol allows the Committee of the Rights of the Child also to establish procedures of inquiry 
in states that violate. We are speaking of accountability uh, before uh, accountability has been mentioned, and I think it's uh, by, by Inger, and I think this is an important issue, of course. And um, uh, having the committee establishing procedures of inquiry was an important step, but nobody uses it. And uh, we cannot use it in the Mediterranean area simply because all the states of the south of the Mediterranean, but one, have not ratified this optional protocol. It's just Tunisia has ratified it, no, no, no other one. And uh, if we go, and I'm citing uh, 10, 10, 10 countries, 12 countries that have their, their border on the Mediterranean. If you go behind them, just the neighboring country to them, the number rises, uh, rises again. So one effort should be made to have that protocol ratified. Because otherwise, uh, a, an important tool of investigation, uh, although it's rather weak, in, but still it is a tool, cannot uh, really, uh, really be used. Uh, one thing that could be done, and uh, you mentioned, and um, uh, Vice Minister Sereni mentioned before, the network, uh, universities and other centers network, uh, for children in armed conflicts, this uh, a network of university, including in these countries of the southern part of the Mediterranean, could raise awareness on one hand and uh, uh, push for ratification of this optional protocol. This will be another tool in the hands of the international community to investigate the violation and uh, work, uh, uh, improve the accountability mechanism. Of course, there is the mechanism of the International Criminal Court, but that's a quite lengthy mechanism and uh, is, uh, it comes very late and it's difficult uh, to uh, have an immediate impact on, uh, on the situations. And in any case, it goes only to repressing the violations. Uh, we have to uh, work more on preventing the violations. And uh, I think a committee can do it much more than the International Criminal Court in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Fausto, Professor Foucault. And uh, I do welcome your proposal to enforce the university's network in this Mediterranean area. The network is already working for having very strong partnership with universities from this region. Then let me thank all the speakers for the very constructive and informative exchange of comments and inputs that has characterized this conference. Each of you distinguished speakers has highlighted many and specific issues on which we needed to work on together in order to ground the four main pillars always underlined by Miss Virginia Gamba. Better protect children in armed conflict, prevent violations committed against children, raise awareness and strengthen partnership for children, and promote lesson learned and best practices. For this purpose, two are the aspects on which we must commit ourselves. First, it is urgent that practical and concrete action must be placed, as that once underlined by Ms. Sereni, like the Italian Concrete Joint Initiative in occasion of the next, next high school conference in Nigeria. Second, the agenda of children in armed conflict is multidimensional and it can only be effectively realized through the synergies of all stakeholders involved. As I said before, they must coordinate with each other, like uh, allow me the allegory, the musical instrument of the same symphony orchestra for playing together a unique, wonderful song, unique, wonderful symphony. And uh, now I like me to move the, from this allegory to uh, a, a wonderful song. It's uh, a, a song that still uh, uh, the university's network on children are at conflict. And uh, um, this song, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something new because uh, uh, the university's network, uh, it's a song promoted also by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And uh, uh, the, net the network, the university's network, to together with its author, Mr. Sergio uh, Jovino, wanted to describe through this song for the first time, and through the language of the music, the grave six violations against children armed conflict, recruitment and use, sex of children, sexual violence, including rape, killing and maiming, abduction, attacks on school and hospitals, and the denial of humanitarian access to children. 
Before listening to and seeing the music video, let me thank again all the speakers, your excellencies, ambassadors, and the participants for attending this meeting. Together, we can truly work for giving hopes to all children in armed conflict. Thank you. souls with eyes so fragile who dream of living in a colorful world suspended in the uncertainty of tomorrow wounded by an incomprehensible world dressed in rage and cruelty then it's time their sleep, injury, their pureness, turn them away and for who, let them play with their dreams, so that when they finish sleeping, they will not be afraid to open their eyes, then it's time to join us all, take our hand. Yeah. 